This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human China rights issues today. are still. The term Ubuntu. A oh, alien and sedition accident. He's making inferential discovery. The importance of an archive. The John Ho Franklin Center. With the sudden emergence of Taiwanese American basketball player Jeremy Lin, his rise to fame and celebrity recalls the rise of another Asian American athlete, Tiger Woods. Anthropologist Oren Starn, author of the new book, The Passion of Tiger Woods, joins us today in studio. And the B.D. Lewis joins us by Skype to talk about the phenomenon that is Tiger Woods. And later we're joined by North Carolina poet Daryl Stover, who will talk about and read from his new book, Somewhere Deep Down When. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left to Black. Welcome back to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined this afternoon in studio with, by Professor Oren Starn, who's a professor of cultural anthropology and history and chair of the cultural anthropology department at Duke University, the author of several books, including the brand new book, The Passion of Tiger Woods, an anthropologistic report, an apology, anthropologist <laughs> reports on golf, race, and celebrity scandal. And we're also joined via Skype by Professor Thabiti Lewis, who is Associate Professor of English at Washington State, Vancouver, and the author of the recent book, Ballers of the New School, Race, Sport, and American Culture, and that's published by Third World Press. How are you doing today, gentlemen? Great, Fantastic. thank you, Mark. So, so Oren, I, I know that you are a golfer. You, you have written a great deal about being a golfer. Uh, is that what really got you interested in writing about Tiger Woods, uh, you know, when the scandal hit? you know, in, in the fall of 2009, uh, 2010, was that really what got you interested in writing about Tiger Woods? I'd been interested in um, writing about golf for a number of years because I do play golf and I'd always thought that it would be interesting to write about golf and its place in American history and society and culture because golf is actually a big thing in America. There's 26 yeah. million golfers <laughs> and yet it has this image as the sport of racist country clubs and sexist country clubs and of elitism and a boring sport to watch on TV. And I'd always wanted to figure out a little bit more about why, what golf is all about in the U.S. And then Tiger came along and I, don't, I mean, it, it was hard not to be fascinated by him if you're a sports fan in his, in his glory years because he was such a dominant, interesting figure. And then when the scandal broke, it really it raised a whole new set of issues about tiger and race and celebrity and his place in our culture. The BD, you know, your recent book is Balls of the New School and you're really looking at a new generation of black athletes, particularly in relationship to their relation to, uh, relationship to, to hip hop culture and a range of other things. Tiger's not someone you normally would think of as being in that context. When we think about the LeBron Jameses and, and, and that generation of athletes, we don't generally think about Tiger in that regard. Talk a little bit about how Tiger functions in relationship to this notion of this new generation of black athletes. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, I think Tiger initially begins by, uh, and I think uh, uh, Professor Starn talks about this, of sort of positioning uh, himself as a, as a black man and engaging race. But certainly Tiger, I think, following the blueprint of Michael Jordan and of course, both are uh, sponsored sponsored uh, by Nike or sponsored Nike uh, <laughs> products. Sub Subsidized that. by by Nike. <laughs> yes, yeah, they both follow this uh, this blueprint of sort of being a racial, uh, apolitical, the antithesis of uh, what I sort of uh, what I articulate as this sort of ballers of the new school, hip hop infused, post civil rights generation that uh, is attempting to really present itself in a way in which it feels comfortable embracing their blackness or Latino-ness or what have you. And Tiger really carves with, I think with Nike's help, this and, uh, and what is his, uh, and his, uh, and his, um, his uh, PR company, this very vanilla sort of uh, appealing um, uh, image, which uh, which garners him this wide array of, uh, of endorsements and appeal. Uh, this almost like, hey, I'm not like them, I'm cool, you know. So I see Tiger on the, on, really interestingly, 
on the back end, the people that he hangs out with and associates with are people that one would consider representing that kind of those scary figures, if you will. But uh, that's in his personal uh, engagements, right? So. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. We're joined by Professor Orrin Starn, who's the Depart of Chair of the Department of Cultural Anthropology at Duke University and the author of the new book, The Passion of Tiger Woods, an Anthropologist Reports on Golf, Race, and Celebrity Scandal. And we're also joined via Skype by Thabiti Lewis, who is the author of the recent book, Ballers of the New School, professor, Associate Professor of English at Washington State, Vancouver. It, you know, in some ways, Orrin, there's no way to think about the Tiger Woods dynamic without thinking about race. No matter how hard Tiger worked against displacing race from understandings of him, you know, in some ways the larger public, you know, came up with a certain kind of cultural uh, lack of memory <laughs> about race in this regard. And, and of course the scandal changes all of this. I wonder, for instance, how this scandal plays out had we been talking about Phil Milk Milk Milkison. Uh, Mickelson, you know, instead of Tiger. You know, granted, there's an example of, uh, of Senator Edwards <laughs> in terms of how folks might respond to these kind of scandals. Um, but do you think the fact that Tiger suddenly gets, Tiger gets raced in this moment in ways that he hadn't been raced before? Yeah, well, one of the familiar syndromes in sports in American society is it's always the person of color who's expected to speak up about race and to offer commentary and their opinion when when racial matters came up, come up. And that, that happened very much in golf. So whenever anything would come up about, well, how come there aren't more blacks on the PGA Tour, or even broader social issues, how come Augusta doesn't admit women, it was always Tiger that was put on the spot. Right, Bill as Clinton if, wanting him to be there with him. Right, the exactly. Robinson, Whereas yeah. the white golfers, sort of invisibility of race there and this yeah. power thing, and they're never asked to, to comment. And, and I think, who knows, Tiger's innermost thoughts. I mean, from you know, when I think a lot of them are about golf and video games and other stuff. Um, but I think you know he he may have been. He, I think he he's he became has become this subject of racial debate and racial controversy in ways that he really wanted to avoid. You know, as Professor Lewis was saying, he really crafts this pretty vanilla post-racial, post-civil rights persona for himself. And even more so than Jordan. I mean, he, he, Even more so, Jordan is his good friend, by the way, <laughs> and I think they're very much cut from the same mold in the sense of these transcendent, amazing, charismatic athletes who want nothing to do with race, with social issues, with activism, and with controversy, and who want to maximize the brand. But one of the things that I found with the, the scandal, and this was especially tracking it in the chat rooms, message boards, boss up, ESPN.com, is this radical re-racialization of Tiger. And he may have occupied for some this kind of post-racial space as Tiger Woods golfing god in his big years, but when the sex handle broke, he gets clobbered with, the, with all of the familiar, stereotypical, ugly stuff about hyper-sexualized black masculinity. And really, in the same way, you know, I think of their parallels with OJ yeah. and the way that once yeah. the crime happens, he gets re-racialized from a sort of corporate, white, friendly guy into violent black man. I mean, how much do you think that has to do, and this for both, you know, Oren and also you, Dabiti, has to do with his choice or his taste, if you will, um, in women? Uh, you know, had we been talking about, you know, 11 or 12 black women, you know, would there have been the same kind of response to this? Um, you know, it reminds me almost a little bit of the Herman Cain, you know, dynamic. Um, sure. You know, would folks be as willing to be as, to cut him off as quickly as they did if we were talking about 12 black women as opposed to 12 or, or 13 white women? But BD, what do you think about that one? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think, uh, Professor Starr, and you, you touch upon this uh, at least quickly in your book, but, um, you know, certainly um, people are probably waiting to say, well, we know what he's going to say. Um, quite frankly, I, we, we certainly can't avoid the fact that there is this sort of racial dynamic regarding his choice of partner. And Tiger much like O.J., gets this sort of, uh, this card where he's an okay guy. He gets a pass, and, absolutely. You know, he gets, this, <laughs> oh, he gets a card of entry. It's, uh, you know, it's the 21st century version of guess who's coming to dinner, you know. <laughs> he's an okay guy. He's got all the credentials. And the outrage is the outrage that he commits this particular 
crime, I think, as Mark is, is uh, queries us, uh, or, um, with his wife who is white. And all of the women happen to be white women, which is the unspoken, I think, <laughs> big uh, fear that takes place in the blogosphere, in the, uh, the uh, sort of subliminal commentary that we hear with the talking heads on a regular basis of, uh, you know, you know, how dare this guy is being given this pass and he's not uh, sort of really honoring this privilege. And so uh, I think that not that I'm ascribing to this, but there's some real problematics that go into yeah. the American psyche and historically situate the the truths regarding this uh, this particular dynamic. And so thus the outrage at Tiger. Because look, who who in their right mind does not think that golf is filled with golfers who are engaging women, who are throwing themselves at them? Who is is thinking that there are golfers that all of these golfers are somehow Puritan figures who are not having extramarital uh, interactions or, or any any professional athlete for that right, matter. I mean, right. we all know the stories of professional basketball and particularly, well, particularly professional basketball and football players who can't get into their hotel room because women, young white women and women of, of other races, they're lying in the hallways yeah. waiting for them as they come into their rooms. And so what's really intriguing for me, and I know you didn't want me to go on forever, is that no one's asked, no one asked the question of, uh, or even broached the morality of these women who are willing to throw themselves at uh, any of these athletes, uh, be, the, be it Tiger or whomever, knowing that he's married. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Can that or? Yeah, I mean, one thing that's interesting to me is the, um, is part of, the, part of the Tiger drama is a drama about race, but it's also about other things. And I think there are particular expectations about golf and what it symbolizes as opposed to, say, basketball or football or professional wrestling. And golf does, yeah, as, as Professor Lewis said, golf has had plenty of, um, of um, uh, men in it who've not been faithful to their wives. And this was said about Arnold Palmer, among others. <laughs> but um, but golf does have this expectation of button down conservative morality, yeah, right, right. and so for uh, whatever his or her his race or ancestry, if you do if you sleep around and aren't faithful to your wife as a basketball player, a pro wrestler, a football player, it's you know at best page two National Enquirer news. But with golf, with this different kind of profile, and also with a different kind of fish, in the sense that Tiger is a gigantic figure right. in the American celebrity pantheon, so any news about him is big news. That's part of what the, the perfect storm that converges to create so much uh, attention around uh, Tiger's sex life. And, and in some ways, OJ was at a much different period in his career, right? His career was over. He was not nearly as popular as a pitchman, you know, at that point in time. It, Tiger is a different kind of trajectory. It, one of the things you mentioned earlier, Oren, that I think, it, you know, it's important to factor into this when you talked about reading the chat rooms and, and the kind of responses on online articles, you know, Tiger really is the first major sports scandal of, of the social media era. I mean, that changed everything in terms of how much access folks would have to the story, how folks could immediately weigh in, the, the reproduction of spaces where folks could offer commentary on it, whether it's the blogosphere or, or video blogs or, or a range of things, really changes how the larger public dealt with this, right? This 24-hour access that we have to celebrities right now gets extended to the life of someone like Tiger Woods. Yeah, that's right. And the, one of the interesting things about social media to me is, 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 how, is how and what to, one, should, one should try to get out of them. In particular, it's easy to say, okay, the people who go on chat rooms and message boards have too much time on their hands and they're not really representative of anything. They're the wackos and the kooks who care enough to post in the first place. And I think that's all true. And you also have the phenomenon of trollers, of people who just go online and post some nasty provocative thing just to, see, out, right? just to see the rise that it gets. Uh, but I also think that you know that, that you get in some of this offstage anonymous chat room stuff, you do get a kind of peephole into you know, the, the racial id of an America, and you get to see things that aren't so visible in public discourse anymore. Because you know, post civil rights, there's a set of words and stereotypes and whatever that you can't say in public on a radio show or on a 
you know, in a classroom anymore without at least getting your hand slapped a la Don Imus. And it doesn't mean that all of these words and ideas and stereotypes have, have gone away, as we know. They've been driven underground and into these different places where people voice them without having to worry so much about getting into trouble and having to apologize and consequences. So I think you do in the internet with this you know, horrible privilege of anonymity that you see a, a set of racial attitudes and slurs and the whole vocabulary of racial animosity is very much you know, alive in its sick way and well. And so getting on the web and getting in these chat rooms is a way to see the way that these things are, are still present in the American bloodstream that you might not, you might not see if you just listen to politicians right. talking or right. watch TV or watch the public sphere. I'm going to ask you a, a very different kind of question about this, um, the BD. Of course, you're broke, you know, balls of the new school dealing with this kind of new generation of black athletes. And, and we've all heard the stories of the extracurricular activities of, of big time black athletes. Think about basketball players in particular. And, and, and they always have this, you know, their crew of folks that they roll with. Right. And, and, and they never answer. Entourages. Right. And, 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 and they never answer their own phones. Right, you know, that, that's the other piece of it, right? The boys always has their phone, so whenever, whoever's trying to get in touch with them, they have to go through the boy with the phone. And, you know, and Tiger, you know, is, is friendly with lots of these folks. You mentioned Jordan, we mentioned Shaq, I mean, all these kinds of folks. I, I always have in the back of my head that there was something about Tiger that almost wanted to be caught not to psychoanalyze him, but to be knocked off this kind of pedestal that he was on. Because if you're doing all this extracurricular things, you know, why is that phone in the house on the coffee table? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, we're so obviously at some point you're going to fall asleep and your wife can pick up the phone and check the numbers. I, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense on any kind of level to me. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I think Professor Starin uh, also broaches this this question of whether or not Tiger maybe wants out of. Uh, but I'm wondering, does he want out of the constructed ideology mm, right, right, of right. him as this palatable figure? That I think, you know, I think this is this is at the crooks of of, of even my own work, which is this question of, are we really post race? How far have we have advanced? If there is a particular set of code and customs that one has to adhere to to create comfort for the the wider world, yeah. right? Where the irony is that while on one hand these the media companies selling products are certainly without a doubt, uh, as one person has admitted to me, we're selling black culture, right? They're using it as the the, the trope through which they're uh, they're selling these products and people while at the same time saying they are just an everyday person and they're, you know, this is, you know, just as good old boy as Brett Favre or Peyton Manning or, you know, one of these guys. And so, you know, why, so I think on one hand, if you go back to looking at, um, and I, Professor Storm mentions this, Tiger's first commercial that Nike yeah. fully embraces and engages this question of race. And of course, this is while his father's around and then you see this sort of slow maneuver. Same thing they do with Jordan. We bring in this sort of kind of cultural, he, re, he, re, he represents A, B, or C, and then begin to move into something else, right? We go with Spike Lee, then we eliminate the whole uh, Mars Blackman component. Yeah. I think Tiger probably is really conflicted, quite frank, frankly, with this particular pressure of this facade and that he has to put forward. Because in many ways, right, it's, you can see how it's constricting to him, right? It, you know, there's a lot of conversation in the aftermath of the Andy Leibovitz uh, shot, you know, shoot mm -hmm. that eventually ends up, you know, on, on, on the magazine. And, you know, she gets a lot of criticism for the way that she shoots Tiger Woods in, 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 these, in this series. And, and somehow she's, uh, you know, impacting, right? She's the same woman, of course, who did the LeBron James. That's right. Um, Which shot, with, you know, that frames like, you know, like King Kong. But, you know, I, I'd like to suggest, and, and Or and I have talked about this before, I mean, there, there seems to be a, a, an incredible amount of agency that Tiger has in that shot. You know, that, that this is something that he wants to project an alternative of himself, right? It becomes a freeing space for him. And, and the reason why the photos don't run when she first sends them is because it's, it's, it's not believable to anybody, 
right? You go three years forward after the scandal, and, and it's incredibly believable, so much so that it becomes this extension of a broader stereotype of black men as applied to, you know, to Tiger Woods. Yeah, and I, I would say, I mean, not to be too deep psychological about this, and who knows what <laughs> Tiger's thinking on the inside, but certainly, I, I, clearly, being Tiger Woods was, was a tremendous kind of burden, as, a, yeah, as well as this. this is a guy whose dad is pressing him into the limelight from age two, who's expected to win every tournament, to be the model post-racial icon, to be the great business entrepreneur, to do a thousand different things. And, and I'm sure for any of us in that kind of position, be a certain temptation to just say, I, I want to check out. You know, I want to. I want to blow up this image and, and reinvent myself as one thing or another. But I would, you know, one alter, you know alternative reading of Tiger and his the way that he's positioned himself within racial debates would be to say, yes, it's about he's about crafting this vanilla post-racial image for himself. But you could also position him in relationship to Barack Obama, who I think is a very parallel figure to Tiger in some ways in the American pantheon. These both their you know, um, children of these global um, mixed marriages. They're both super transcendent superstars and traditionally white professions, politics and golf. But Tiger, Obama has always played within the one drop of blood rule and foregrounded. He's a, you know, mixture, yes, my white mom in Kansas, my grandparents, but he's always said, I'm a black man. Politically, I mean, he's made a very political distinction. Politically, the political and in the way that he's lived his life, he's, you know, a lot of it's, or some of it anyway, has been about consolidating his black blackness and marrying a, you know, a working class African American woman, inner city activism, joining a black church, and so forth. Whereas Tiger really never wants to play the one drop of blood rule in a conventional way. <laughs> he's really into this whole multiracial thing, calling himself Cablin Asian, which is easy to make fun of and has its whole set of problems and stuff, but actually is a, 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 diff, a kind of position that's getting articulated in the American racial landscape. This idea that, okay, yeah, I have some black ancestry, but I'm also you know, part white, I'm part Asian, I'm these multiple things, I'm not just white or black. And Tiger is really positioning himself in this different um, multiracial space, for better or worse. It's, it's really quite different from, from Obama. Uh, or in, you know, well, go ahead, the beating. Yeah, ahead. well, I, I think that's interesting. It, what's, what's also interesting about that title that he constructs is certainly as a teen, a uh, person in his young 20s, but he also, uh, what's really interesting is that he starts it around the call and then all the other uh, components of what that identity is. And so I think, you know, Tiger is certainly someone as a young mm -hmm. person, I think mm -hmm. very confused and has misgivings about, as you point out, his identity, and I think part of him wants that identity to be Caucasian, and then he says Blasian Asian. You know these, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not even sure. I don't even want to know how to completely or correctly pronounce his uh, his identity without sounding disrespectful. I mean, I I get what he's going at, and I think that he's certainly in some ways ahead of the curve in in the reality of what does it mean to be American and what is American identity. You know, and it is this sort of you know this real interesting mixture of a number of different you know cultural foundations that sort of all come together, which creates a lot of the kind of uh, culture wars that take place. But I certainly see Tiger on one hand as this sort of, uh, I think about the film Bamboozle and where the uh, guy at the end is forced to tap dance and once he stops dancing, he's going to be killed. I think Tiger's just, he's fatigued and he's tired yeah, of tap yeah, dancing absolutely. with the absolutely. with the face on and he's like, okay, I, I'm done, you know. And um, and so, you know, that tiger has been killed. Yeah. And, you and, and, you know, if he could continue to go back to winning tournaments, right? I mean, I, I think much of this would be forgotten, you know, very quickly. <laughs> Isn't that the beauty of sport? <laughs> well, that's one of the things is these, the, you know, American sports icons, particularly African-American ones, can be re-racialized and reinvented any number of times. Yeah. So Tiger started out as black, positioned as this young black pioneer in the white sport. Then he gets post-racialized and oh, honorary white or whatever. Then he gets re-racialized into just another stereotypical over-sexualized black man. And yeah, as Mark's saying, I, I think he's actually going to have a big year. And I think he's ready to, to, start, to start doing his thing on the course again. And one, one, you know, what race will Tiger be tomorrow? Will he be re-post-racialized? It's, it's not impossible to imagine. You know, that is more uh, up in the air than whether or not he will win again is who, who will this figure be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
There is one thing I would say about Ty, again, I mean, I, he's the model of this corporate athlete and wants to take race off the table. But I think there's another way that you could see his whole Cablinasian thing as, as a kind of denial, and one could call it a sellout and be critical of it. I think it all, but there's also a, a critique of, of the constraints of American race relations in that term. And the, the reason he's sitting on Oprah's couch after his big triumph in the 19, and Oprah is just gushing over him and calls him my hero, an American son, and just mm -hmm. thinks he's the greatest thing ever. And she says, well, you know, how do you define your ancestry? And that's when he trots out this term Cablinasian. And as he explains it, there's, there's this wonderful, in some ways, kind of common sense naivete about it. He says, well, you know, my, I was raised black, but I was also raised Asian. And if I just call myself black, it writes my mom and the Asian part of me out of the equation. And that is absolutely correct. Right. I mean, correct. what America does is makes us choose right. to be right. black or to be white, to be this or that. And if you're the one thing, you can't be the other. Unfortunately, that's also the lived reality and <laughs> horror of race yeah. in America. But it's also as powerful a, a set of a way of thinking as it is, it's, it, there's, there's also this horrible arbitrariness to the way that race works. And, and Tiger is trying to find a way out of that, even if he never really does. But, and, and you know, what you point out is, is exactly on the mark. Um, I always think about, again, uh, and, I, and you point this out in your work as well, the dynamics of power. Uh, in this in this sort of uh, race trap. I mean, I always think about, you know, why can't we just say with what um, Duvalier said to the uh, white journalist who was in Haiti interviewing and said, well, how do you, what is the percentage of, uh, of whites in Haiti? And he said, you know, 99%. And he said, what? And 99% of white. And he said, well, how do you come to that? He said, well, you know, how do you define race? And he said, the same way you do, one drop. So if you have one drop of white, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's all about power dynamics and who controls these particular narratives. And so I think that's the bigger question that really is at play is that we could if we could if you have if we have power to, or as we empower ourselves to control these dynamics, then we could decimate the, the necessity or the, the prevalence of, you know, how race uh, functions. Right. You've been watching Left of Black. We've been joined this afternoon via Skype by Professor Tabidi Lewis who is Associate Professor of English at Washington State Vancouver, author of the recent book, Ballers of the New School, and that's published by Third World Press. And we're joined in studio by Duke University anthropologist, chair of the anthropology department, Orrin Starn. He's the author of the new book, The Passion of Tiger Woods, an anthropologist reports on golf, race, and celebrity scandal, and that's published by Duke University Press. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. Thank you, Mark. Hey, thank you. This was a pleasure. Take care. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and uh, <laughs> there were many occasions when just driving through D.C. saw Gil Scott Heron walking uh, down the street. This poem is entitled, I Saw Gil. Urban bush, battle-bred ancient songster, breezing through the rebel me, carried sounds of the resistance, voice piano, nomo, traditional notifying and signifying. Through your words, we laughed at the water antics, wetting the gates of white houses and capital domes, the lies flowing like so much prohibition booze. Presidents peeing on themselves in shame. You called their names, their macho myths dissolved, your rhythms fought and won wars many artists were never drafted for. Groping and squirming, pimped on the contract deal corner, you never turned your back when our minds cried out like hands reaching out from a homeless son or daughter, seeking salvation from this chilly bottle full of Babylon. Shaman whipped up a healing beat, chanted no retreat, no defeat, only reliance on inner strength, fortified in your voice ringing out Rally cries brought forth and through fellow challengers to the misbegotten throne. Its legs tilted and tottered, unleashed truth untelevised, round midnight banners unfurled and swirled cadence, a hoodooer at the halls and walls of Jericho, percusses prophet babble, poured verbs upon verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and images, giving sight to our blind tolerance of injustice, 
blinking, winking, and nodding to the beat. We see now, we chant loud. What's the word? Johannesburg. What's that music? Storm music. Taking blasts from ray guns, we stand firm, radiate a ritual romance with resistance dance, put distance between the conscious us and ignorant things. We saw Gil, we heard Gil. We becomes I, the total combinations of our pleasure and pride, and all knowingness takes over inside. Mardi Gras, musical meanness, metamorphosis of complacency to civil disobedient idiocy. Cool to hot, blue to red, dancing blood pumps shimmering hips of revolution. Fire-winged humans fly on blues bomb raids, powered by dew tunes, sending wake-up tones, screams, yells, stomps, zips, zooms, stop. Hurt hearts ache in the absence of your soul. Where did it all go? The prophet has passed on, crucified now by success. His psalms to us are on record. Our psalms to him are yet to be sung. The bullet in the back of Henry Dumas has not visited him. The fire in his heart, unlike Larry Neal, has not been totally doused. What keeps the fire burning is a strange mix of earth and air. Earth, she is sick. The air, polluted. The doctors are on vacation. I saw Gil coming down the hill bag in hand, was it full of hot steamed crabs, crack, smack, or cures? I saw Gil in his poetry, and Gil the man just yesterday, asked myself, what happens when the poet's pen runs dry? Was the life that you always stayed ahead of now the loser in the long distance run? Lungs choked by a tired spirit, Mind torn by visions of too much hypocrisy, settling into a nonchalant daze. I saw Gil and wondered the epitaph as I let loose a disturbed laugh. A wild stallion studded continues to produce, even holds one or two more good runs, doesn't it? A good father passes on to his daughters and sons what he has won doesn't he? I saw Gil crack a smile before his voice boomed baritone. The question still went unanswered. Tonal memories reverb the power of past performance. The now of our struggle calls the tune. Welcome back to Left to Black and we're joined in studio today by Mr. Daryl Stover. Uh, whose day job is the program director at North Carolina Humanities Council uh, here in North Carolina. He's a former program director for the St. Joseph's Historic Foundation, the Haytai Heritage Center here in Durham, North Carolina. But we're here to talk to you today about your new work of poetry, Somewhere Down, Deep Down Where. That's somewhere deep down when. So when so spelled <laughs> W H W H E N. How are you doing today, Darren? Oh, I'm fine. I mean, thanks for joining us in the studio. You know, when, when black folks really think about poetry these mm -hmm. days, uh, immediately, you know, we hear folks who try to convince us that hip hop is poetry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, lots of folks have made money off of spoken word mm -hmm. over the last mm -hmm. 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years watching mm -hmm. things like the Deaf Poetry Jam. Mm -hmm. um, but what's it like to just simply still be a poet? <laughs> well, uh, to, to, to be a poet then begs the question, uh, what is that being? And uh, uh, for so many, relative to the tradition, it's about writing and fighting mm -hmm. with the words. Mm -hmm. It's about putting it on the paper. Now, I have to admit, I come out of a long tradition whereby not only is it about putting it on the page, but it's also putting it out there. Right, right. Uh, there's a strong connection to the oral tradition. So I am one of those advocates that, that see that rap element of hip hop uh, as poetry. Uh, I am also one that sees a much longer tradition, an oral tradition mm -hmm. coming out of the African diaspora that is connected uh, to storytelling, griots, blues, preaching. Yeah. 
all that. Yeah. Uh, who are some of your influences? Well, let's, let's start where it all started <laughs> for me. My mother used to read quite a bit of Paul Lawrence Dunbar okay. to me. I was just sitting in the barber shop and that, that, that was broached. We started talking yeah. about toasting. Yeah, that would be 360? <laughs> that's correct. Uh, right. same, go to the same barber shop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Got to go to where it gets done. Or shall we say the do gets done, done. right. <laughs> but yeah, so Paul Lawrence Dunbar would be the start. But certainly, um, you know, I am strongly influenced by the likes of both Amiri Baraka and Larry Neal. Mm -hmm. uh, being in a household where actually I first came across a collection of essays by Amiri, home, uh, yeah. and then uh, acquired uh, the uh, anthology Black Fire. So those are some uh, initial components, yeah. but immersing yourself in uh, what is an African, African-American tradition of poetic expression uh, continues to beg the question of then what aesthetic, you know, because there blues aesthetic writing, there is certainly uh, traditions that m many African-American poets have followed that immerse themselves in forms um, both European and otherwise, yeah. classical forms if you will. Uh, I myself, I cover the waterfront, but the real influences on my pen are science, jazz, blues, uh, little Joe down the street yelling at <laughs> his homeboys, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's funny because I think, you know, the way that we have academized, mm -hmm. academized, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. if that's a word, yeah. um, but the way poetry has, is often taught in schools and universities, mm -hmm. Um, we tend to forget that this is work that was actually meant to reach Lil Joe down the street. That's right. Um, when you think about the success of the black arts movement and folks mm -hmm. like Hakima Booty and mm -hmm. Sonia Sanchez, I mean, mm -hmm. they were writing poetry mm -hmm. so that every so it would resonate with the lives That's of everyday right. folk. That's right. Uh, you know, for me, I, you know, yeah, you can swing philosophical, you can swing so creative with the wordplay that it might indeed marginalize. Yeah. Uh, a, a whole collectivity of folks. And I see my role as being one trying to excite the masses yeah. and inform, entertain, encourage, and inspire the Getting masses. Getting them back to the word. That's right. right. Uh, you mentioned Amir Baraka, mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Baraka will be joining you at your book launch party at Haytai Heritage Center mm -hmm. on, on March the 3rd. Talk a little bit about his legacy at this point in time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you think about one, his longevity, um, you know, really being at this for more than 50 years. Mm -hmm. When you talk about his own transformative process, mm -hmm. you know, the way that he's been able to kind of remake himself. Mm -hmm. Talk about his legacy really in terms of not only black poetry, but black expressive culture in general. Well, um, well I think it's important to realize that, you know, yes, uh, uh, some may not know, yeah, uh, 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 a major contributor to the beat era of the 50s, mm, right, right. certainly the 60s and, and the black arts movement from that point forward. Uh, certainly a whole focus on not just being an artist and a poet, but understanding that uh, an artist, an individual, has a responsibility and a role to play right. this is in an other. Activist tradition. That's right. right. It's an, an activist, activist tradition. tradition. And right. so it's about informing uh, informing uh, the, the masses, stirring them to action. And uh, that, that is that, that tradition that, I, that it appeals to me, that has inspired and encouraged me to do the things that I've done publicly. But most importantly, when we look at uh, the fact that he's immersed himself in not just poetry, playwriting, uh, film, right. uh, Dutchman. Yeah. That, yeah. You, you, it's, it's, it's hard to ignore. Fiction nonfiction, uh, science fiction, uh, jazz music and criticism, our music, blues and otherwise. Uh, so he's laid down a track record and a very uh, uh, strong road uh, for, for us to follow. He always speaks about how Sterling Brown pointed out to mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and A.B. Spellman and others in showing them his record collection and pointing out. That's your history. Yeah. So when we start to look at our history and we start to look at what, what uh, uh, documents yeah. our presence, 
Uh, music is a strong aspect of that, and I think many times uh, a lot of us take that for granted and don't immerse ourselves in uh, what is another wonderful uh, body of work mm -hmm. that both informs us as poetry when you start looking at the lyrics at uh, Curtis Mayfield, yeah, yeah. Marvin Gaye, Gil Scott Heron. Yeah. So uh, yes, he, he lays down a wide, wide uh, highway yeah. for us to uh, travel up and down uh, to revisit ourselves and also recreate ourselves in a tradition that's both oral and literary. So it's speaking of the late Gil Scott Heron, and I know we've talked about him mm -hmm. in the past, and, and when you were uh, still up in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and you would catch glimpses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of, mm -hmm. of him. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, talk a little bit about his legacy and, and, and what it was like for him this mm -hmm. last time mm -hmm. to come back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, and, and we, of course, we finally get the yeah. opportunity to, to read yeah. his memoir. Right, yeah. right. And uh, that memoir is a, just a wonderful tome, I think. Uh, uh, the, the most important thing that I've been gleaning from it and reading it is the fact that um, uh, communities are documented every step of the way. Where he grew up in uh, yeah. Tennessee, right. uh, the time spent in Chicago, the time spent in New York, the time spent in Washington, right. D.C. Uh, many of the artists that performed with him resided in D.C. for quite a while. So that whole notion of community and a collectivity yeah. of artists also provides a whole nother example of what has been a very uh, common feature. And if we look over the decades of collectors of jazz musicians mm -hmm. who lived together, interacted, or lived within the same communities. And Sun Ra is a good place to start. Yeah. Uh, but certainly when we look at uh, how Gil Scott Heron uh, also chose to engage in a sort of writing that advanced the notion of uh, encouraging understanding and challenge to the powers that be, uh, to, to identify political systems for what they were, uh, and to do that with both poetry and music. So when we say what's the word, yeah. everybody knows it's Johannesburg. <laughs> Always will be. Always will be. <laughs> We're here with Daryl Stover, and you're going to read some stuff from your new book, yeah. uh, Somewhere Deep Down Wind. I can do that. Us. Thank you. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Ethnomathematics of Braids for Gloria Gilmer, mathematician, and Howard L. Kraft, who used to carry his own uh, significant plot of braids, playwright calculator of words he is. Repeat, stretch, oil down the cut, Twist tight shape upon shape, Geom geometry of life, comb chaos can cure disarray into tessellated masterpiece. Pity, pattern, undone do, gets grips, tight twists, repeating age old algorithms, equating twirl curls, bat naps to undead DNA, multiplexed onto cabeza of dark strand storage, plopped on the floor between knees. Please, ouch, don't, ouch. Head, scalp, brain, mind, hurts with the calculations of twine, calibrated centimeter by intricate centimeter into the extensive groove soothe of architectural completion. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Missed one, stretch mind's expansive eye into how many, how long, how artistic, how, how, some white people may ask, do you do that? With no answer, the subdivision integral of X rootedness to infinity matrices is done naturally.
produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.